<laughs> All right. Uh, let's get. S whoops, did that work? Come on. One slide to advance. Uh, tech diff right off the bat. Okay, that'll work. Cool. All right, let's get started. Uh, hi, friends. Um, so I tend to talk fast. I will try not to. I will probably fail at some point, so I apologize in advance. Um, but that's the way it is. Um, so this is a not at all terrifying crash course on worker threads. Uh, for the record, the not at all terrifying part is for me, not for you. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, 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 I, need, I need to reassure myself that this talk is not at all terrifying. Um, so I, uh, my name is Rich. I work at the UCSF, the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, I work at their library. Uh, he works at a library. What is he doing here? Shame on you. I do not need to establish my credentials. Library people are awesome. <laughs> and, um, uh, but the, uh, the library does some absolutely fantastic and important work. Google UCSF Industry Documents Library sometimes. It's pretty cool. But I'm actually here, whoa, hey, nice, okay. Um, I'm actually here because I do a lot of work on Node Core. Um, I've also been writing an ever-expanding rock opera about a steakhouse for over a decade. Um, it sounds uh, something like this. Let me see if this, this will work or not. I don't know if the... Oh, bummer. Okay, that's okay. I should have said something ahead of time. Okay. What? Uh, steakhouse. By the way, um, save the applause, like, enthusiasm, because what's going to happen is, like, they're doing lightning talks over there. Every 10 minutes or so, there's going to be, like, applause that's going to interrupt me, and then we're going to respond. I'm going to count to three, and when I do, you, like, just erupt into the wildest, most <laughs> uncontrollable, loud, stamp your feet, clap, scream, bang on the walls, and, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, we'll just, and, and, and each time we have to do it, we'll do it for longer and longer. But anyway, um, okay, so uh, I didn't come here to play excerpts or sing excerpts about my, steak, about my uh, rock opera, but I am here uh, to talk about Node. Uh, before I do, though, a couple disclaimers. The views expressed are my own and not those of my employer. That's the pretty standard disclaimer. And... Um, the views expressed are my own and not necessarily those of Node. There's 100 some odd other people with commit bit in Node Core. There's 19 other people on the Node Technical Steering Committee, including the person who's gonna be giving the closing keynote. Um, and uh, we thankfully don't all agree with each other. Uh, so with that out of the way, back to Node. Hey, have you heard about worker threads? Uh, they were introduced in Node 10.5. Uh, 13.0 was released today, if anybody's following along. But uh, the, the, uh, they were introduced in 10.5, but it required a command line flag, so nobody likes that. So use node 12 if you don't want to use a command line flag, which, as I said, you don't. Um, specifically, if you use node 12.11 or newer, uh, that'll be good, because that's that was when support officially became stable. So we're not going to like change it from out underneath you, uh, or at least not on purpose, we won't. Um, 12.13 was released yesterday, as I said, and 13.0 was released today, so maybe choose one of those. But anyway, enough about that. What are worker threads? Uh, so they're kind of like web workers. If you've, Who has worked with web workers, by the way? Okay, cool. So they're kind of like web workers, but, but different. Um, there's no shared workers, for example. They're also kind of like threads in other programming languages, but also not, not quite. So if you've used threads in other programming languages, cool. And if not, don't worry, because we're about to talk about it a little bit. So JavaScript is single-threaded. Even if you don't know what that means, there's a really good chance that you've heard JavaScript is single-threaded before seeing it on this slide. JavaScript is single-threaded, arguably. Uh, I don't want to have that argument, though. The point is your code is, uh, does one thing at a time. So it's why this program never exits. Um, if you're unfamiliar with Node's particular uh, uh, API process exit just means what it says on the tin, exit the process. So this code will never exit because there's only one uh, execution thread. There's, uh, so a timeout is set to run at 100 milliseconds and then we enter this loop that never ends. The timeout actually won't ever end be until this loop ends first because there's only one thread that can only do one thing at a time. So it has to finish this before it can, pro before it can do timeout, before the timers can run. So the loop 
requires the timer. The timer won't run till the loop ends. Therefore, you're stuck in an infinite loop. Um, this is called blocking the event loop. If you already understand what that means, great. And if you don't, just trust me and look it up later. There are some really great videos of talks about it on YouTube. It's really cool. I personally recommend What the Heck is the Event Loop Anyway by Philip Roberts. Uh, there's a link to that on palacefamilysteakhouse.com. In fact, pretty much everything I'm talking about, there's, there's a bunch of links about worker threads there. So, you know, code, everything. So when, you know, if, you, if I start not making any sense or if the cheering gets too loud between lightning talks, um, you know, you can go there and check it out later. So you may be thinking, but Node.js, you know, the big thing about Node is it's asynchronous, right? So it can effectively do many things at once, like handle multiple simultaneous a uh, HTTP requests or read multiple files. Like, you know, it doesn't wait for, for you know, stuff. It all just happens at once. And that's, that's true, but mostly for input-output, for I.O. Um, if you're doing, say, data science-y stuff, or maybe you're doing graphics processing or something like that, something that's CPU-intensive, um, you know, then let's just say the default state of things is not as asynchronous. Um, it's pretty easy to block the event loop. So prior to worker threads, the usual way people would um, offload CPU in a non-blocking way in Node was the cluster module. And if, that's, if you're using that and it's working for you, that's great. Uh, but here's the thing. Cluster spreads your workload out across multiple Node processes. So, you know, each one has independent memory and so on. So sharing large amounts of data is often problematic, but also each process consumes the full amount of RAM required by Node, which, you know, each Node process has V8, the JavaScript engine, and, you know, that, that was written for Chrome in it, so on and so forth. Um, so this can be really inefficient. Um, although, again, if it's working for you, great. It works fine for a lot of, a lot of things. And uh, even for the... But, you know, even for some of the things it works for, worker threads might work out better. Um, so, because worker threads are lightweight, and they're also better at sharing data. Um, you can actually share uh, memory, uh, in, you know, if you're, if, you, if you're careful about it and you do it the right way. Um, so, anyway, let's just dive on in. Um, here's a Hello World example, and we're going to go through it step by step. Uh, cool. Uh, is, can... People see it? Yeah, okay, person in the back gave me the thumbs up, so I'm going to forge ahead. Thank you, person in the back. Um, the first line pulls in three things from the worker threads module. Uh, it pulls in the worker class. It pulls in the is main thread boolean, and it also pulls in the parent port object. Uh, the worker class will be familiar to you if you used web workers. If you haven't used web workers, you might still understand what the, web, what the worker class is if you've read Karl Marx. Worker, class, worker, class. Okay, thanks. I'll be here all week, but seriously, as the kids say, or you know, S-R-S-L-Y, as the kids say. Um, we'll, uh, we'll explain it along with uh, the is main thread and parent port later. Just know that they all come from the worker threads module. Okay, I'm going to slow down. Um, so we'll start with is main thread. And uh, so next line uses it, the next line uses it to check to see if we're in the main thread or if we're in a worker thread. Um, so it does, you know, what it says right there on the tin, the main thread is the one that launches all the worker threads. So we're checking that we're in the main thread so that we know it's okay to launch a worker thread. If we didn't do this check, we might launch a worker thread that launches a worker thread that launches a worker thread because we're doing something that I wouldn't really do in something that was an example code here, which is the worker code and the main thread code are all in one file. Um, I... I, I, I would shy away from that, but, but in order to keep the hello world example simple, we're doing it that way. So we're checking to see if we're in the main thread. Okay, so we know we're in the main thread, so what we're going to do is create a worker. And uh, so we use the constructor for the worker class. That's what new worker is all about. And we pass it file name, underbar, underbar file name, which is the special node variable that contains the name of the file currently being executed. You can, uh, like I said, you can create a worker thread to run any JavaScript file you specify. You can also pass in a string, and if you send the right thing for a second argument, it will, it will treat that string as a blob of executable code. Um, I would avoid that for the same reasons you might avoid using eval, but if you want to do that sometime, that's available. It's an option. Um, so we've created a worker. Now let's listen for messages from the worker. Uh, this is the usual event listener syntax. Um, yeah, we'll let that one go. Okay. Um, uh, so remember, we're in the main thread still. 
and, uh, and we're not in the worker thread, and we're listening for message events on the worker we've created, and when we get one, we're going to use console log to print whatever the message is that were sent. And that's it for the main thread. So we were in an if block that checked if we were in the main thread, so now we're gonna go to an else block and do the worker thread code. And the only thing we're gonna do is use parent port to send a message using its parent, uh, using its post message um, method. Um, so in the main thread, parent port will be null, but uh, in the worker thread, parent port contains the, you know, the message port to the, to the, to the main thread. So we use post message to send data back to the, you know, it could be an object, it could be, it could be anything serializable, basically. Um, but we use it to send data back to the, um, back to, and, and if you do it right, you can also use it to, like I said, to share memory, which we probably won't get to, but, um, uh, but it's in the docs that I post at pilesfamistakehouse.com. So, um, so anyway, we use it to send a message that says hello world, and as we mentioned before, that, you know, that, that's it. So as we mentioned before, we had a listener for messages that would print out anything. So this just prints hello world. Um, not terribly useful. There's much more elegant solutions to printing hello world, but it does introduce the very basic concepts of worker threads. So now let's do something equally contrived but more interesting. Perhaps you remember the game Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. Anybody? Yeah, lots of nods, hands, cool, okay. Uh, if not, it's pretty simple. Given the name of any actor in a film, your job is to connect them to Kevin Bacon in six or fewer steps in the following manner. So let's say you are challenged to connect Katy Perry to Kevin Bacon in six or fewer steps. Katy Perry was in Zoolander 2 with John Malkovich, and uh, John Malkovich was in Queen's Logic with Kevin Bacon. Boom, Katy Perry to Kevin Bacon in two steps. So there are already websites that solve six degrees of Kevin Bacon by using IMDB data, I believe is what typically they do. Uh, several years ago, I wanted to do this for musicians playing on recordings of, you know, of individual songs. So I made a site called Music Roots, but Google took down the API I was using after acquiring it, so it's been broken for a long time, so let's fix it. Um, first, surprisingly, there is no reliable database available of what musicians play on what tracks on what recordings. Uh, not all music, they only have information on who played on what album, but not track by track data. Not music brains, they only have artists associated with tracks, not individual musicians associated with tracks. Not discogs, they have published album credits, and sometimes those have track by track data, but most of the time they don't. And moreover, album credits are often wrong, often intentionally so. For example, Ozzy Osbourne's Diary of a Madman credits Rudy Sarzo on bass and Tommy Aldridge on drums, because those were the two people in Ozzy's band at the time. But actually, on the recordings, it was his previous bassist, Bob Daisley, and his previous drummer, Lee Kerslake. And that right there is the sum total of Ozzy Osbourne content in this talk. Um, anyway, that brings us to Wikidata, which has some data along these lines, but a whole lot less than you'd think. But also, and that, you know, that, that's cool, though, because people can add data to Wikidata, but it's very, 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 very slow for the types of queries we need to do to get the data out and use it in a web page in real time. So, um, so I built my own database and I published it. It's very incomplete, but it'll do here. And there's the link, but the link is also at palacefamilystudyhouse.com. Um, I also built a rudimentary little visualizer for it. Oh, crud, I was gonna, yeah. So let's, let's actually, let's take a look. Let me see if I can make this happen here. I should be able, yay, okay, cool. So, so this is um, Elvis Presley, and if I click on him, it shows all the, all the Elvis Presley tracks I have in there, which aren't very many considering how much he was recorded, but that's what I have. And here are the people who played on those tracks. You can go to, say, James Burton, who was his longtime guitarist and a session person, and this shows all the tracks that James Burton and Elvis Presley were on, so we can now go ahead to James Burton. See, he's on records with a whole lot more people. There's, you know, Katie Lang and Roy Orbison, and there's Tom Waits, and you get the idea. So that's fun if you want to poke around at that. You can see the URL up there. It's also at Powell's Family. Um, okay, so let me get that out of there. Okay, so, so that kind of just gives you an idea, hopefully, of like, you know, it was hopefully clear already, but if it wasn't, you know, what, uh, what uh, the data looks like. And, you know, anyway. So in order to solve these things, um, you know, these, like, Six degrees of Kevin Bacon, but uh, you know we uh, you know you do what you normally do like the naive solution would be to do what's called a breadth first search, 
and uh, I am now about to give the world's worst overview of Breath First Search. This, th if, if I wasn't giving this talk, this would be my lightning talk. It would be the worst overview of Breath, of breath First Search. So let's go back to connecting Katy Perry to Kevin Bacon. Step one, is Katy Perry in fact Kevin Bacon? That's what that JavaScript triple equals there is all about. Um, the answer is no, obviously not. Don't be ridiculous. Katy Perry and Kevin Bacon are different people. Step two, find everyone that was in a movie with Katy Perry. Do any of those people happen to be Kevin Bacon? The answer is still no. So then you take all those people who are in a movie with Katy Perry, and you find all the people who are in movies with all of those people. And are any of them Kevin Bacon? And as we talked about earlier, the answer is yes, because we can go Katy Perry, John Malkovich, Kevin Bacon. So we're done. And that's it. Congratulations. You have just witnessed the worst, most useless explanation of Breath First Search. So now we're going to do the second worst explanation of Breath First Search. This one will be mildly more usable, I think. So uh, we are, again, going to connect Katy Perry and Kevin Bacon. But this time... We're not going to do it through movies. This time we're going to do it through music. Kevin Bacon has a band with his brother, Michael Bacon. The band is called the Bacon Brothers. I, I'm not making that up. Fun fact, as you can see in this picture from Wikipedia, Michael Bacon's nose has never been successfully photographed. I did make that up. Okay, so let's see if we can connect Katy Perry to Kevin Bacon via music. So step one again, is Katy Perry Kevin Bacon? No, no, get out of here with that nonsense. Um, so here's a visualization of Katy Perry in the middle. And everyone she recorded with on her album, One of the Boys, which I'm sorry to say is the only album of hers that I have data for. You can open a pull request to the GitHub repo if you want to correct that injustice, by the way. But um, anyway, Katy Perry is that circle in the middle. And each circle in the surrounding ring, and we're going to get back to worker threads. Um, is, uh, is, is someone who is one step away from Katy Perry. So legendary horn musician Jerry Hay over there on the right. Hey, he's, uh, you know, he's uh, on, the, on the record. And one step away is also, where do you go? Da at the bottom, David A. Stewart. Uh, you're, uh, he's Dave, he was Dave Stewart in the 80s and 90s when he was in Eurythmics, but then, and I'm not making this up, there were just too many other Dave Stewarts, and they played a lot of the same instruments he played. So... He now, goes, he now gets credited as David A. Stewart. Notably absent from this ring, however, Kevin Bacon. So now imagine we take each of the circles in the ring around Katy Perry, and we find out everyone who has recorded with all of those people. We would take all of those people and make an outer ring with circles for each of them. Now, I didn't actually do that, but I did scroll this blue line around things to show where that outer ring of circles would be if I had done it. And... The number of circles in that ring is going to grow exponentially, right? Or exponentially-ish, anyway. Like, um, you know, it's going to be a lot more circles because it's like everybody connected to 20 people. Um, so, uh, yeah, so you don't want to see all those circles anyway. But I'm here to tell you something exciting about the outer ring. It totally has Kevin Bacon in it, and that's basically Breath First Search. Now, we can take, the we can take those results and construct our path, which will be that Katy Perry had Dave Stewart, uh, on her track, I'm Still Breathing. In fact, that song was written by Katy Perry and Dave Stewart. And then Dave Stewart played on the 1997 John Bon Jovi track, Queen of New Orleans. And in fact, that track was written by John Bon Jovi and Dave Stewart. And John Bon jo Jovi played on the Bacon Brothers track, Boys in Bars. There's Kevin Bacon in, in, the, uh, in, the bon, in the Bon Jovi Southwest there. He's sort of like around Dave Stewart and Cher is around there. And... Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, so f uh, fun fact, uh, Boys and Bars is the only Bacon Brothers song I have in, 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 in the uh, in repository. So there's going to be a lot of connecting Kevin Bacon through John Bon Jovi. Anyway, um, so that's Breath First Search. So let's go ahead and implement it. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, for purposes of this presentation, it's an implementation detail. You can look up online how to implement Breath First Search, or you can just figure it out a lot of times. But... Um, uh, there are trade-offs in various ways to implement it when dealing with this kind of data that we're talking about. And we don't really have to go into it right now. The, the main, you can check out this repository for how I implemented it, as well as the other two algorithms we'll be talking about in a bit. But the important thing is that our approach will keep the CPU busy rather than do a bunch of work up front. Like you can, do, you, you can basically do the equivalent of indexing your database to make it go faster. But I didn't do that. Like, I'm just actually looking at the data and, and putting it together as things are going along. And this is so that we can see how cool worker threads are. 
Um, but it's also a legitimate trade-off one might make in the real world. It's, it's not always worth it to spend time upfront pre-processing. Uh, sometimes it's too time consuming and sometimes it just takes too much storage. Anyway, so here's what it looks like, although this is kind of pseudocode because I've hidden all the important stuff away in functions that I use here without showing their definitions. But again, feel free to check it out in the music routing repository if you want to. So anyway, let's step through this thing. The first line gets all the tracks for the start person. So let's switch from Katy Perry and Kevin Bacon. Let's say the start person is Aretha Franklin and puts all those tracks as the element at index zero in the array of tracks for the start person. The index indicates how many steps away we've gone. So zero is just the tracks that one person is on. Um, so this line populates the corresponding array of individuals that are the source of those tracks above. In this case, it's an array of just one individual, namely Aretha Franklin. So for the two lines starting here, we're doing the exact same thing, but for the target person, let's say it's Carrie Brownstein. Um, uh, if this isn't making any sense, it's no doubt my fault. So, uh, you know, but uh, like I said, don't need to, you don't need to worry. Just know that this stuff is gonna be CPU intensive. Um, I'll be done quote unquote explaining this pretty quickly. So uh, this line checks to see if we have a match by seeing if there are one or more tracks in both track lists. And then lastly, this while loop runs until a match is found. Uh, this line adds all the information and all the uh, information about individuals and tracks resulting from going out one more step. BFS is for breadth first search. Um, so you go out one step further from wherever wherever you are, and uh, and it puts all the fe so all the people on tracks with Aretha Franklin. Then next time it runs, it's all the people on tracks with all the people on tracks with Aretha Franklin, and so on. And this line updates the matches, so the while loop will stop running if we have a track that's in both lists. Each time though, that, lit, that last while loop, we, through that last while loop, we add another one of these rings. Oh, I said it was blue, but it looks like it's rendering as some other color here, but you probably figured out which, which line I was talking about. So remember each of these circles will grow exponentially or exponentially-ish. Um, so longer paths will take a longer time, but there's a bit of a solution there. First though, let's see how breadth first search performs on my laptop. Um, by the way, uh, you know that I ran this yesterday using node 12.13 rather than node, uh, well 12. yeah 13, rather than node 13.0.0 .0 because one of the features in node 13.0.0 .0 is that search duration would probably be rendered as 14.02 seconds rather than in milliseconds. But that's an aside. Um, okay, so uh, here's the run with the results. It took more than 14 seconds just, just to do the breadth first search. And that's a lot of work, so we can do better even without worker threads. We're gonna talk about bi-directional search, which is actually just a special case of work, of, uh, of uh, breadth first search. So here's how it works. First, Katy Perry is not Kevin Bacon, despite the striking resemblance they have in these photographs. Um, again, we look for everyone that's connected to Katy Perry and check to see if Kevin Bacon is in there. And again, he is not. Now we do something different. Instead of doing another search on those results, we bounce back to Kevin Bacon and we get everyone connected to him. So like I said, if you thought it was a crime that I only had one record for Katy Perry, poor Kevin Bacon only has one song and it's just those people that he's connected to. So anyway, uh, but because that population is much smaller, it's a vastly more efficient query. Um, yeah, so let me make sure I actually said everything I want to say about it, blah, 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 blah. Um, yeah, so anyway, uh, we check to see if there's any overlap in the two sets of musicians, and if not, we do another query. So let's, let's say we're running them simultaneously. Uh, Maybe the Kevin Bacon one finishes first and we do another query on, on, you know, to get the next ring of people. That next ring of people is gonna, you know, is gonna have, uh, you know, uh, uh, Dave Stewart in it because he played with John Bon Jovi. So that's, you know, the, so that'll, that'll solve the problem, we're done. We can get from musician to A to B. And uh, so bi-directional search is kind of like running two simultaneous breadth first searches. Um, so once again, if that's Katy Perry on the left and that's Kevin Bacon on the right, there's a bunch of little dots, but those are all the people, just like Katie and just like Kevin. But they're, you know, it's not the scale. But that's the first ring, and then, you know, this this is breadth first search. We do another one, and that's going to have a whole lot more dots and be a whole lot less efficient. Then we do another one. Whoops, and whoops, and there we go. And then finally, we 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 have Kevin Bacon in the circles. But compared to to bi-directional search, again, no overlap. Okay, there's Katy Perry. Oh, look, there's Kevin Bacon. Okay, oh look, we already have a match. So you know. This should be more efficient. Let's, uh, you know, hopefully it's self-evident that's more efficient, but if not, you can go to Wikipedia and they, they do the big O math to show that it really is. Um, 
So here's bidirectional search. It's just like breadth first search. It's the same in code. Um, yes. Anyway, uh, uh, right down to the comments, except for the contents of the while loop at the bottom there. Um, we just add a few more lines there. Uh, so here's the while loop just by itself. And you can see that what we do is we do the breadth first search starting from the start individual, check to see if there's a match. And if not, we do a second breadth first search starting from the target individual, and we repeat until we find some overlap. So holy moly, we went from 14 seconds to less than three seconds. Awesome, great, we're done. But wait, let's, uh, why be bound to a single thread? Rather than doing one breath first search from the start person, waiting for it to finish, checking results, doing another breath first search from the target person, waiting for it to finish, checking for results, why not run them simultaneously in separate threads? And you know, whichever one happens to like get results faster is the one you lean on a little more. So to create our worker threads this time, we're calling new worker again. And this time uh, we're putting the worker code in a file called worker.js. There's also a new thing in there in the second argument, which is a worker data property. This allows us to provide the ID of the individual to start with. Uh, worker threads can do this awesome magical thing where if you do just the right thing, you can share memory. That's not what we're doing here. Uh, this data is getting serialized and sent. Uh, but worker data, w this just sends a copy basically. But if you're, uh, you're interested, if you're interested in that next level memory sharing stuff, it's in the worker thread documentation. Link to it. Um, so over in worker.js, reading the worker data value is done like this. Let's import the worker data property from the built from the built-in worker threads module. And then we read the value of the ID key. Uh, so we're going to context switch. We're going to go back to the code in the main thread. So uh, so we have an error, we have an error listener that simply rethrows any unexpected errors from the worker. Uh, I've run this code thousands and thousands of time and time, and I've never managed to get that to actually do anything with, um, you know, unless I introduce an error. But um, so, you know, hopefully that will never run. Uh, but anyway, we have a callback that we use when we receive a message from the worker thread. Uh, the index here, uh, the index here is, uh, is used just to distinguish the results for the start person, Aretha Franklin or Katy Perry, and the results for the target person, Carrie Brownstein or Kevin Bacon. We use zero for the start and one for the target. Could be whatever, but Let's head over to the worker code again to see how the worker invokes the callback, and then we'll check out the callback itself. We're back in the worker code. Now, uh, when each worker is created, it grabs all the tracks the individual is on and sends them all along with the individual back to an ob you know, as an object to the main thread. That post message will cause the callback in the main thread to execute. And let's check it out. So here's the callback. So again, index is a value that, you, that lets us you know, use the same callback for Katy Perry's tracks and that we use for Kevin Bacon's tracks. We also get all the individuals from whom the list of tracks is derived. And we check to see if there's any tracks that are on both lists, thus indicating that our expanding circles are overlapping and we can stop. If we have a match, we call a function called done. We'll check that out in a second. But if we're not done, we send a message to the worker to go get us another expanding ring of tracks and individuals. I'm not going to show the worker code that listens for the message as it's pretty simple for you know, what we've already seen. It's, it gets the value next, and then it you know, gets the next set of search results and sends them back to the main thread. Just know that, that to receive the message, the workers listen for the message event on the parent board object. Okay, so I do want to talk about this done function. Uh, it, removes the, you know, it removes the listener we have for both workers. And then it calls this method that's on all workers called terminate. And what terminate does is it ends the worker thread immediately. Return, it returns a promise that resolves to the return code of the worker thread. It's almost always going to be an error because an error code because the code didn't exit cleanly if you sent terminate usually. Um, it's possible that there's a signal that should be listened for in there or something. I meant to look that up before I got up here and I didn't. But anyway, uh, we don't even bother getting the return result. We just say terminate. And move and move on with our lives. Um, the code exits pretty much immediately. So, lastly, we print our results. So let's see how it performs. Uh, single threaded breadth first search took over 40, 14 seconds, and single threaded bidirectional search took under three seconds. Oh my gosh, it's less than seven hundred milliseconds now. The believing is so hard to be doing. Um, Unbelievable, this should be illegal. Okay, um, 
So now I have to admit, the, you know, as you, as you probably gathered from the last 20 minutes of just talking at you about individuals and tracks, the main motivation for, you know, um, uh, doing this, you know, wasn't, you know, you know, there was some interest in doing a pedagogical exercise of, you know, well, let's do it like a simple app with worker threads. But it was really a vanity project, you know. I wanted the program to officially figure out, you know, how far Powell's Family Steakhouse is from Little Nas X. So the answer, by the way, is six degrees. And it starts with Little Nas X, of course. And the first degree is Billy Ray Cyrus, who featured on Old Town Road. You may be as surprised as I was to learn from this public domain photograph of Billy Ray Cyrus that he actually looked like that as recently as 2009. Um, the second degree is country star Mary Chapin Carpenter, who, along with Billy Ray Cyrus, was on Dolly Parton's song, Romeo. I give uh, Dolly her own slide because, uh, you know, she deserves it. Uh, Romeo was on her 30-second studio album. She wrote it. She produced the record. People who aren't country fans don't realize the extent to which she is in control of her sound and her career. She's an amazing songwriter. She's a legend and a force to be reckoned with. Do not mess with Dolly. Also this, you know, since we're starting from Old Town Road and all. But uh, the analogous legend and force to be reckoned with in Node is Anna Henningsen. She's the one most responsible for implementing worker threads. As far as all things Node go, it's difficult to, um, to give Anna too much credit. Uh, but back to this nonsense. After Dolly Parton's track, Mary Chapin Carpenter goes through Saturday Night Live band leader G.E. Smith and Tom Waits and a great trumpet player named Chris Grady before getting to me. But why should I restrict fun vanity exercises like this to me? Head over to this glitch URL and try some stuff out, you know, if you want to, like, see how to connect, I don't know, Jack White to Vanna White. I have no idea. Um, I'm blanking. But anyway, that glitch URL and pretty much everything I've mentioned and, and a lot of stuff I haven't mentioned, a few Medium articles about worker threads and stuff, um, are all at palacefamilysteakhouse.com. You should go check it out. And... That's it. Thanks for indulging me. Wow!